Welcome to Simple Truth Gospel with Kirian. Today we will study 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. If you missed any of our previous studies, always go to our website kuim.org or to our SoundCloud or YouTube channel Simple Truth Gospel with Kirian. And all our teachings are posted online. Before we continue, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for another opportunity for your children to gather this morning to learn your word, to depend upon your word. We ask that you will speak to us through your word today. Dear Holy Spirit, open the eyes of our understanding. Help us to understand what you are going to give us today. You are the greatest teacher. Help us not to lean to our own understanding, but to acknowledge you in all our ways that you will direct our paths to us. You know where everybody is this morning and what they need. So I pray that you will minister to us simultaneously. Help us to understand the word of God, the scriptures. Without understanding, we will be wasting our time and it will not be productive. Heavenly Father, from eternity past to eternity future, you are God. Help us to understand that your word is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Help us to understand that it is human traditions that make the word of God of no effect. Teach us to number our days that we may obtain a heart of wisdom. For everything that you've done for us, precious Father God, we will take no glory. But we say all glory, all power, all honor and thanksgiving belongs to you. And everybody said, Amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. My good friends, today we will continue our study through the book of uh, First Thessalonians. The, uh, First Thessalonians, <clears throat> the book of Thessalonians was written by Paul, the apostle. He wrote this book uh, while he was at Corinth. Uh, he started um, uh, uh, this church uh, during his second uh, uh, missionary uh, journey. Uh, like you know, uh, Macedonia is the capital, uh, uh, Thessalonica was the capital of Macedonia. Actually, it was named after um, Alexander the Great Sister, Thessalonica of uh, Macedon. So Paul, during his second missionary journey with uh, Silas and Luke and Timothy, went to this area of uh, Macedonia. Uh, when he had a vision, in that vision, so a man said, come over to Macedonia and help us. So they went over there. Uh, the first place they visited was uh, Philippi. In Philippi, they had so much trouble that they left Philippi and they went to Thessaloniki. They were in Thessaloniki for about three weeks or about a month before they were run out of town by some of the envious Jews. So while Paul was at Corinth waiting for Timothy to come back, because uh, he sent Timothy back from Athens to go and oversee what was going on with this church. Timothy came back while Paul was at Corinth with good news that this church is making progress. So Paul wrote them this letter just to clarify so many things, just to address some issues, some things that came up while Timothy was there. So this is just a quick summary 
uh, uh, and then we will go ahead now and continue. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. Here, Paul is talking about um, what happened to them while, while they were at Philippi. You remember the story uh, when they got to Philippi, uh, as soon as they came into Macedonia, the first place they visited was uh, uh, Philippi. And uh, on the Sabbath day, they went to the river bank, which is where the ladies met. And one of them was um, a lady, a seller of purple. And uh, Paul and Silas and uh, Timothy and Luke, uh, they were in Philippi for many days. And uh, every day there was this girl who was possessed with the spirit of divination. And he will follow Paul around saying, these are the servants of the Most High God, which show us the way of salvation. She did this for many days, the Bible tells us, until Paul exercised authority over that demonic spirit. And that demon was cast out. This offended the people uh, uh, who employed this girl because they were making a lot of money from her fortune telling. So this got Paul and uh, Silas in trouble. Uh, they were brought to the magistrate who tore up their clothes and commanded that they should be beaten severely and uh, thrown in jail. So after they were beaten and thrown in jail, uh, which the process led to uh, the jailer being saved, the next day they had to leave town. And with all the beatings they received, they had to go to the next city, which is Thessalonica. So Paul is telling them here, he says, the beating which they received at Philippi did not hinder them. Rather, they came in with boldness. They spoke the word of God with boldness. And he said that the word of God which they spoke with boldness was not in vain. It produced fruit. The Spirit of God took this word, the word of God, and confirmed it. And we saw the results in the lives of uh, these converts. In the area of work of faith, last week we covered work of faith was one of the results, which means the way they lived changed. There was a corresponding action between the faith which they received when they got born again and the works that followed. So they gave a corresponding action to their faith. You could see them and notice something is different. The Spirit of God in them helped them change the way which they lived. Now that way, the, their lifestyle is conformed to the image of Christ. Again, we talked about uh, labor of love. One of the results. In labor of love, they labor to the extent of weariness. And just because of their love for Christ. And we also we saw hope of patience in them. They had this hope of the glorious appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ. They were living in expectation that Christ is going to come back. So, Paul tells them that uh, the gospel that they brought to them was not in vain that it, it produced fruit. Now, as we are going through uh, this chapter, I'm going to tell you marks 
of genuine ministers. Now we see number one mark of a genuine minister is boldness in speech. They will a minister who will teach the word of God with boldness, without any favoritism. They don't care if they're going to lose their congregation or not. But they want to be bold and speak what the word of God says. They are not there to favor anyone. But they are there to make sure that the word of God is spoken. So if you want to identify a true minister of God, this is one of the ways. In verse um, 3, it says, For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in the seat. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. So what is he saying here? He said that they brought to them the gospel, the real gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying here, he says, we didn't come to you with fancy speeches. We didn't come to you with uh, 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 the messages that you want to hear. Get rich quick messages. God is going to bless you now. He's going to give you a million dollars if you sow this seed here. You know, with this kind of messages, you can draw a lot of people to yourself. But Paul is saying here, he says, we did not come with this kind of messages. We came to you with the true gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. There are so many churches. That's what they preach now. You know, fancy messages. Something that the audience don't want to hear. You know, they want to promise you this, want to promise you that. God is going to do this. God is going to do that. If he just uh, uh, sow this seed here or sow that seed there, uh, things will change automatically. So this kind of, kind of message is they are preaching to their congregation. Paul is saying here, we did not come with this kind of messages. Rather, we came to you straightforward. He said, we were honest with you, with the fear of God in our heart. Now, the second way to identify a genuine minister is they teach the word of God. They teach the true word of God. They don't teach human doctrine or human traditions. And anywhere you see the word of God is taught, the spirit of God is always at work in that place. You will see changes. You will see the people making progress in their spiritual lives. You will see lives being transformed because the word of God is spoken in that place. Remember, Jesus says it is human traditions that makes the word of God of no effect. Human traditions, they make the word of God of no effect. This is the difference between a shepherd and a higher link. For a higher link, it's just a job. So they get paid. That's all they, are, they, that's all they care about. So they are like entertainers. They want to tell jokes. They want to make the people laugh. They want to just uh, entertain them. And they want to grow the population based on this entertainment. But the shepherd is the one who is called by God to feed the flock of God. Remember in Jeremiah, the Bible tells us, God says, he says, and I will send you shepherds after my own heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. It is the will of God that the people that we put in these positions, the position of uh, being a minister, a teacher, a pastor, that there are people already called by God. 
that they are shepherds, not hirelings. Because when we bring in people who are already called by God, there will be progress in that church. The church will be making a progress. So when we hire people, you know, I've, I've seen uh, uh, interviews when they're trying to hire a pastor. First of all, you don't hire them. You choose people who are already called by God. You appoint them. So they're looking at their resumes. They want to see which one here is very uh, uh, productive in growing the population, the congregation. Uh, which one of them speaks uh, uh, much better than the other ones? Uh, which one is very eloquent? Which one has oratorical uh, uh, qualities? These are what churches are looking at before they get someone to be their pastor. So this is very wrong. We want to get people who will teach the word of God. Very important. Because my people perish for lack of knowledge. Knowledge of the word of God. So that is what he's saying here. And if we continue in verse 6. He says, Nor did we seek glory from men either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children, so affectionately longing for you. We were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our lives. Because you had become there to us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil. For laboring night and day that we might not be burdened to any of you, we preach to you the gospel of God. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says here, we came to you like servants. We did not come to you as a, we, 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 uh, puffed up as apostles. We did not use any of our apostolic authority upon you. But we came to you as a mother nourishes her own children who are gentle with you. We did not come for the money. That's what he says. Remember, Paul was a tent maker. And most of the times, everywhere he went, he supported himself. He did not depend on the congregation to, you know, sow seed of this one, sow seed of that one, sow seed of that one, and God is going to bless you tremendously, and you're going to be fruitful, and you will multiply. No, he wasn't there. He wasn't like that. There were only few places when he received offering from people. So what kind of ministers do we have in our churches? Do we have people who have deviated? They have from the true gospel. Paul is supposed to be our example. They were not chargeable to their congregation. Rather, he walked with his hands to support himself and the people who were with him. But you go to so many churches, they have so many programs, so many orchestrated programs, you know, and they will tell you, if you don't give to this program here, we're going to close our doors. We're going to fold. We're going to close down. I'm, tell, I'm asking you, is God not able to support his own church whenever you begin to hear stories like that is a high time you check out of that place because god is able to provide for his own church and sometimes you will see these ministers in in uh, li living very extravagant lives at your own expense so they are rich in making you a merchandise Making merchandise out of you. Paul tells us here, we did not come for the money. 
Rather, we brought the good news to you. Jesus says, if anyone wants to be first among you, let him become your own servant. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom to many. He says, you call me teacher and you call me Lord. You are right, for that's who I am. But if I, your Lord, and your teacher have washed your feet, he says, you ought to wash one another's feet. So we, he's talking about being a servant. You know, the word minister, that's what it means. It means to be a servant. Not someone who will sit on a pedal stool and want to be served. Now, another mark of a genuine minister is they are servants of the people. They are not puffed up with pride. They are not looking to be recognized. Do you know who I am? I am Reverend, Doctor, uh, Pastor, uh, uh, Apostle, uh, you know? No, 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 that's, 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 not, that's not what they are. You ought to be a servant to the people with humility. He that uh, exalts himself shall be abased. But he that humbles himself, God in the due time will, Oh, exhort that one. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So now we continue in verse 10. It says, You are witnesses, and God also, how devotedly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. As you know how we exalted and comforted and charge every one of you as a father does his own children. That you would work worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and uh, glory. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So here he tells them that we live an unblameable life before you. We live by example before you. We were like a father unto you. Just like a father will exalt uh, his own children, encourage them to, 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 to walk in the right direction, to be prosperous in their doings, just like a father will. You know, Paul says you may have 10,000 uh, instructors in Christ, but you got only one, one father. He said they were like father unto them. And, uh, and they pointed to them the way of Christ. They exalted them to take up the image of Christ. They were like the one who showed them which way to go. Telling them that don't go this direction here. Don't go to that direction there. This is the way to go. The way of Christ. Another mark of a genuine minister is they will always point you to Christ in their own ministry. They are not in the church just always exhorting you, uh, 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 God is going to give you a million dollars. God is going to give you this. God is going to give you that. They always point you to Christ and they will always point you to the things which are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father, not on the things which are below on this earth, the things that will perish, the things that will be dissolved with fervent heat. So every time you see the minister, they are pointing to you, they are pointing Christ, they are pointing you to Christ. This is how you recognize a genuine minister. Now we are in verse 13. It says, For this reason we also thank God without season. Because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcome it not as the word of man, but as it is in truth the word of God 
which also effectively works in you who believe. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul tells them, he says, when we brought the message to you, you did not treat this message as word of man. Rather, you acknowledge that this is the word of God. You acknowledge that all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and it is profitable to doctrine, profitable to re for, for reproof, profitable for correction. He said, you proved all things and you held fast to that which is true. This is a tremendous uh, progress for a church. At this point, we think that this church is only about um, uh, 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 six months old. But they already made this progress. They did not depend. They, 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 they looked at the way that uh, Paul uh, uh, brought to them as the true word of God. As Christians... He tells us that we must understand the importance of the word of God. The importance of where we get the word of God from. The source of the word of God. You see, when Paul brought this message to them, that was the only thing they got. But now we have the word of God with us. We have the Bible. So, it is our responsibility to put our nose in the word of God and know what the word of God says. It is our responsibility to double check those that, that teach us the word of God. To make sure that what they are teaching us is the word of God. Because anytime you put your faith in the word of God. Anytime you know the word of God and you put the word of God to work. It is always productive. It is always effective. It does not fail. The reason why it doesn't fail is this. The word of God is forever settled in heaven. That God uphold this universe by the word of his own power. That the heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will never pass away. That he will always watch over his word to perform it. That's how important it is. So we must know the source that we are getting the word of God from. And once we identify that this source is authentic, we must put our faith in the word of God. So that we can bear fruit. Remember the word of God is quick and powerful and it is sharper than any two-edged sword. And the word of God it says the righteous shall live by faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. So we must put our faith in the word of God. Remember that God and his word are one. They are the same. So if you want to see progress, make sure that where you get in the word of God is the true word of God. Make sure that you are a doer of that word of God. Because let him that comes to him believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those that diligently seek him. For his word will never fail. Very important that this church, they acknowledge that the word that came to them was the true word of God. Remember the Judaizers, those who followed Paul wherever he went, just to pervert the message that he gave to the people. These Judaizers, they were already in Thessalonica. And they were there telling people that Paul came for the money. So one of the reasons why Paul wrote this letter is to defend the authenticity of their ministry. That their ministry is genuine. And he is so glad that the people received this word. The message that he brought to them as the true word of God. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But how can you identify the word of God? 
from what is not the word of God? It's by putting your nose in the word of God. It's by knowing the true word of God. And thereby you can identify the human doctrine or traditions when they are preached around you. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So now we are in verse 14. It says, For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God which are in Judea in Christ Jesus. For you also suffer the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeas, Judeans, who killed both the Lord Jesus Christ and their own prophets and have persecuted us. And they do not please God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they may be saved so as always to fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. <laughs> oh, glorious. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Glory. Hallelujah. Paul commends them here. He says, you have now, you've been, you've become like the, uh, 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 the, 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 the church at uh, Judea. He says the church at Judea, they were persecuted just like you are now being persecuted. But the good thing is, they understood that uh, persecution comes with the uh, uh, Christian work with Christian package. You see, when you, get, when you get born again, persecution comes along with it. And as, as a matter of fact, it, it, it even increases for the simple reason that you are no longer a partaker of this world system. You, are, you, you don't belong to them no more. So now they want to persecute you because you are no longer one of them. But do you know that every time the church is persecuted from outside, it increases. It's an advantage to the church. Remember in the early, uh, in, in, during the early church, when uh, in, in Jerusalem, the Christians were persecuted and they were scattered all over the world. And because they were scattered, they took the gospel with them and wherever they went, they continued. It was a way to spread the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So even here in Thessalonica, they have come to the understanding that persecution will come. It's, it's, it's just part of the whole thing. The Bible tells us that those who will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Jesus says, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome this world. James says, count it all joy when you go through diverse trials, knowing that the trial of your faith works patient. And he says, let patience have her perfect work in you, that you may be complete and entirely wanting nothing. So when persecution comes, God allows persecution. It is a way to mold us, to make us strong. It's an advantage unto us. We should not be running away from temptation. Through temptation, you get perseverance. So now, through persecution, he, now they believe and, uh, and now the church at Thessalonica, they understand that, you know, uh, persecution is just part of it. But the church in Jerusalem, you know, the, 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 the church in Jerusalem, they, they, they were the first ones to be persecuted. And it did not stop the gospel. Rather, it helped the gospel to even spread further. The Jews here persecuted the Christians because of their unbelief and their unpersuadableness thereof. They did not believe in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. So why 
Because of this, they want to stop everything. They want to stop those who believe. They even hinder them in Jerusalem from reaching the Gentiles. For them, they think that uh, 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 salvation belongs only to the Jews. But then they don't believe that Jesus Christ is the means whereby they will be saved. It is because of their unbelief that they crucified the King of Glory, Jesus Christ himself. Their forefathers did. They walked in unbelief. Even though Prophet Daniel prophesied to them in Daniel chapter 9, if you read um, uh, uh, verse 24, 25 and uh, further down, Daniel prophesied to them. He says, from the day that the edict was given to go and uh, rebuild and restore Jerusalem to the coming Messiah, Messiah the Prince, he says will be 483 years. So if you count the day that the edict was given by Atazor, this long germanus in 445 for bc to the day that jesus christ made his triumphant entry into jerusalem from mount olives exactly 483 years if they paid attention they would have understood that the messiah was right there in their midst this is the reason jesus christ wept coming from mount olives he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killed the prophets and stone those that are sent to you. He says, how often would I have gathered your children together? Just like the hen will gather her chicken under her wings, but you will not. He says, behold, your house is left unto you desolate and I live will not come back unto you say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. He said, if you had known even this day, the things which are made for your peace. But now they have escaped from you. He says, now the enemy will surround you and they will destroy you completely. Did you know this was fulfilled in 70 AD? Under General Titus, the temple of God was completely destroyed with no stone unturned. So many people killed and a lot of them taken into captivity. Because of their unbelief, unpersuadableness, they don't want to go in, but they don't want others to go in as well. What kind of people, what do you think about this kind of behavior? And so is even up till today. There are so many people, they don't believe in Christ Jesus. They don't believe in the divinity of Christ. They don't believe in virgin birth. So many things they don't believe. But instead of them to keep it for themselves, they are going about trying to hinder others from believing the true gospel. And remember what he says. He says, the wrath of God is upon them to the uttermost. If you are part of this group, hindering others from coming in, be careful. Be careful. For there will be a day of wrath when the wrath of God will visit those who have chosen not to repent. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 17, it says, But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. Therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again. But Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For you are our glory and joy. So Paul here expresses his desire to visit them again. You know, like I said earlier, Paul was in this place for about three weeks. 
Because the Bible told us that uh, for three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them at the synagogue, uh, telling them that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. But he got run out of town shortly after this. So he said, even though I got run out of town, my heart is still with you. I wanted to come visit you again and again, but Satan hindered us. Paul wanted God to be the one that will open the door. Remember, he, he prayed, uh, he said, pray for us that God will open the door for us. Because he learned his lesson. <laughs> what lesson am I talking about here? Remember when they wanted to go to Asia, the, the Spirit of God forbade them. They wanted to go to Britannia, the Spirit of God forbade them. Until the Spirit of God opened the door to Macedonia, even though... They, they, they received so many uh, persecution in Macedonia area, but the gospel there was effective and productive. So now he doesn't want to push the door down himself. He wants God to open the door again so that he can come and visit them and minister to them again. So now... He talks about uh, what his joy is. Even though I haven't got a chance yet to come back and see you. Even though Satan hindered us. He said, but my joy is so great. Do you know what the joy of Paul is? The joy, his joy is the crown of his rejoicing. The crown. That is what his joy was. He says, the joy that in that day, when I look in the kingdom of God, I'm going to see you seated around there with Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He said, this is my joy. The joy that in glory you will be there with me. This should be the motivation for every Christian to advance the kingdom of God. Every Christian, remember, we are all called to be ministers, even though you are not called in the fivefold ministry, because the word minister means to serve. Anywhere you are, you are urged to advance the kingdom of God. Jesus says, Go in all the nations, preach the gospel. To preach the gospel means to proclaim, to tell the good news. And every one of us is called to do the same thing. So this should be your motivation, that the kingdom of God does not end in you. That you become now an oasis, a transmitter, whereby God can take from you and there is another one. So that day in the kingdom of God, you will see so many people in there. Those God used you as a vessel to bring into his own kingdom. This should be our joy and our motivation. That day you will be there. Perhaps somebody will tap you at this, on, 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 your, on your shoulder and ask you, do you remember me? And they will tell you, because of the gospel you preached, because you supported the ministries, because you supported evangelists, because you passed that track that day, I had the word of God. I was convicted by the spirit of God. I gave Jesus Christ my life that day. And because of that, I am here today. Thank you very much. Now, another mark of identifying a genuine minister is this. They are not in it for physical rewards. They want the reward to be what Paul just said here, crown of rejoicing. They are not so excited about you giving them one million dollars or donating to their own church. That's not the excitement. That's not the joy. But the joy is souls are coming in. The kingdom of God is being populated. The kingdom of God is being advanced. There are so many people now coming to Christ through the gospel that they preach. This is the, one of the ways that you will mark a genuine minister of Christ Jesus. 
Good friends of mine, we've come to the end of today's teaching. I believe we covered everything. If you're hearing my voice now and you are not yet born again, which means you are not yet a Christian, now is an opportunity for you to become a Christian today. Perhaps you will ask, what is, what does it mean to be a Christian? Christian is someone who depends on Jesus Christ 100% for his or her own salvation. Who does not depend on his own human efforts or good works. But who believes that Jesus Christ died for his or her own sins. And God raised him from the dead on the third day. And then they ask Jesus to come into their life and become their Lord and their Savior. And they start relationship with Christ Jesus. Personal relationship. That's what it means to be born again. Unfortunately, there are so many Christians, people in the church, church members, who are not Christians. For the simple reason that they depend on their good works, self-righteousness, to come into the kingdom of God. But there is no other way to come into the kingdom of God apart from Jesus. And Jesus alone, not Jesus plus good works, not Jesus plus circumcision, but Jesus and Jesus alone. Jesus himself says, says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Says, no one comes to the Father but by me. There is no other name given under this earth whereby we must be saved, if not the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Except the man be born again, Jesus tells Nicodemus, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So there is no other way. Maybe you belong to another religion and you're thinking we all have access to Father, God. That all roads lead to God. But I'm sorry to disappoint you because it's not so. If you are talking about God, the creator of the heaven and the earth, then there is only one way to get to him, and that way is you must go through Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That is why the day you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. And don't say, let me go and get my acts together before I come and then be born again. You don't have such time, because tomorrow is not guaranteed to you. People die every day. So it becomes imperative that you got to act and act quickly. Do not procrastinate or, or put it any longer. Do not postpone it any longer. But he stands at the door, he's knocking, and he wants you to open that door so that he can come in. You are the only one who can open this door. No one else can do it for you. Your personal relationship with Christ must be you who will activate it. Now the price has been paid, for he bought the whole field. But you are the one, the treasure in that field that he wants to take out of the field. Do you want to remain in that field while he's taking out his own treasure? That is why you got to come in, make the decision. People are condemned. Because they believe not in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Jesus says, if you don't believe that I am He, the Messiah, you will die in your sin. The time is ticking. You don't know when it's going to be your turn to have appointment with death. For we all must have appointment with death someday. We have planned about our own retirement here on earth. When we are old, we've planned how we're going to retire. But what about when we leave this earth, this world? For everyone is a spirit and spirit, spirits, they don't die. You will spend eternity somewhere. Is it going to be in heaven or is it going to be in hell? For hell is a place where all who reject Jesus Christ as a Lord and Savior will spend their eternity. 
And you don't want to go that route because it's an unpleasant route. But you want to be among those who will sit at that marriage supper of the Lamb with Jesus Christ of Nazareth on that day. So now I'm going to lead you in a very short prayer. If you pray this prayer and you mean it with your heart, you will be saved right now. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that you are my Father if I receive Jesus Christ today as my Lord and my Savior. I believe that he is your son, that he died for my sins, and you raised him up from the dead on the third day. Dear Jesus, I ask you to come into my life, be my Lord and my Savior. Now I believe by faith that I am born again. My sins are washed away. My name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Father, I glorify your name for this. Welcome into the kingdom of God. If you say that prayer, you are now a child of God. You are a Christian. I advise you to find a good church where they teach the word of God and become a member of that church so that you can grow in your faith. Because faith will only come by hearing the word of God and being a doer of that word that you heard. Buy a Bible and read, study the word of God. And the Holy Spirit will give you revelation, knowledge, and understanding as soon as you make that commitment. I want to use this opportunity to thank our partners all over the world. Those helping this ministry and other ministries to advance the kingdom of God. If you want to become a partner, please go to our website. It is kuim.org. Remember, it's only those who hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and they receive it with joy and then they do what the word of God says. They are the only one who will receive the benefits of the word of God. Friends, I pray for you this day. May the Lord bless you and be with you. May he lift up his countenance upon you. Give you peace and sound mind. And give you revelation knowledge of the scriptures. And give you joy even in the midst of trouble. Give you prosperity. Give you victories in your life. And bless your weak. Making you even more than conquerors. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Remember, there is an end. And your expectations will never be cut off. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Baruch Hashem Adonai, Kanda Bosco, Broko Street, Tatata, Baruch Ingalande, Nebra Angradeske Dosco, Shuroko Pade. Vora angra de maseri brosuto unjelika ala prados te.